Hello, and welcome to another episode of What's on the Pile. I'm Nathan Besner, and joining me is Shane Lee. Hey, what's up? And Jenner. And Jenner. Tonight, we'll be checking out not one, not two, but three CODAs. CODA, directed by somebody named Claude Lalonde and written by a Louis Godbout, starring Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the USS Enterprise as a famous pianist. He has helped past his stage fright by friend and agent Gus Fring and a journalist played by the prisoner who escaped Tom Cruise. Uh, we'll also be discussing the award-winning and Oscar shortlisted short film Coda, an interesting animated piece that tells the story of a lost soul finding death. Uh, we'll also talk about that other Coda, the one that actually won an award or whatever. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I didn't see it. Um, why don't we jump straight into games? Uh Jenner, I'm given to understand you have some uh, some new uh, Shane game. Yes. Uh, oh, you know what? By, by the way, before we go any further, I can't take credit for inventing this game. I'm pretty sure somebody else invented it. I'm pretty sure I've heard it on another podcast. So I'm not going to... I think they might have played it on Doug Benson's podcast, but he plays a lot of games, so I don't know, or some variation of this. So I'm not going to take 100% credit. Well, it's uh, yours according to this show. Yeah. Okay. We are Fair we enough. are a low listenership podcast. You're gold. <laughs> sure. uh, okay. Uh, the uh, the first one of these. Uh, I don't know. This is either going to be very simple or very difficult. I'm really not sure. Uh, would be Krull, Flash Gordon, Michael Mann's The Keep, and Life Force. Yeah, I just saw Life Force. I don't know anyone who was in it. Patrick Stewart was in it. Uh, was shit. he? Yeah. I mean, I saw it in October, so I've already forgotten it. Mm. Oh. Uh, and we should also probably explain the rules of the game to yes. people again, just so that they oh, know. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, this is one where uh, we name a movie that has a person in it who was in one of the movies that we have covered on this program. Okay, so, okay, what was the first one again? Krull. Krull, oh, man, it's... So who's in Krull? It can't be Liam Neeson. Yeah. Do, you, uh, do, you, do you want a hint? I've forgotten the, the rest of the cast for Krull, so you might need to help out in that regard. Well, there, there is a sort of uh, meta hint built into the relative time period of the movies that I mentioned. Okay. <laughs> so, like, 80, like... Mid late eighties? Wait, am I off on that? Krull is early eighties, right? Yeah. Early, early to mid. Early to mid. To mid eighties. What have we covered in that time period? And go I'm not even going. By, I'm not even going by actors anymore. I'm just going by time period. <laughs> what? What were the uh, second, third, and fourth again? Okay, uh, it was Krull, Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon, which I've never seen. Oh. Yeah. I haven't either. Oh, well, crap. Uh, <laughs> the Keep, the Michael Mann film. Scott Glenn. And Life Force. I mean, would it be Reanimator? No. Scott Glenn, Ian McKellen. I'm trying to remember movies that, if we've done any movies with these people in them. We have. Okay, can, do you want another hint? Yeah, please. Sure. Okay, you were right about Patrick Stewart. Oh yay! <laughs> in in Life Force, that that was, was the it, reference there. Is it Dune? Yes. Oh yeah. That's I know. the only Patrick Stewart movie we've done. Yeah, Li Life yeah. Force was Patrick Stewart. The Keep was Jurgen Proschnow. Oh, that's right. Flash okay. Gordon was Max von Sydow as Ming the Merciless, which I actually oh. knew. And, and Krull been. was Francesca Annis as the Widow of the Web. <laughs> I love the Widow of the Web. I love that whole sequence so much. Oh, I, no, that, that, Krull is great. Krull yeah. is fantastic. That's actually going to come up at our uh, at our next segment. Um, but did you have another one you wanted to do? Uh, yes. Uh, let's see. Okay. The Sidney Lumet Murder on the Orient Express. I don't know who's in that. No. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Okay. Straw Dogs. The Sam Peckinpah version. And Alien. The only actor I remember from Straw Dogs is Dustin Hoffman. Yeah, me too. 
Well, Alien, that... so Al- Alien, we've got six actors. Right? Yeah. We've got Jeff Cotto, Tom Skerritt, Sig- Sigourney Weaver, Veronica Cartwright, Ian Holm, John Hurt. John Hurt? Uh... Oh, shit. We've done a John Hurt movie, I'm almost certain. We did the straight story. That was Harry Dean Stanton. No, that was Harry Dean Stanton. That's who yeah. I'm thinking of. John Hurt. Okay, oh, he was yeah. also an alien. I forgot about him. <laughs> my brain. Um, yeah, that's why my brain fucked up. <laughs> Haven't we done a okay. John Hurt movie? Uh, do you want a hint? I yes, have, please. I have four more movies from the same uh, uh, picture. <laughs> uh, Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. So different actors? Four yep. additional actors? The Bride... The, the remake of The Bride of Frankenstein from the 80s. Wow. Ah. Laurence Olivier's Richard the huh. Third. And this may or may not give it away. The Shining. <laughs> oh! oh is it, is it, uh, go ahead. Fucking... <laughs> <laughs> the, the fucking... Is it the first... Is there our first episode? The mental, not, qui- not quite, but close. The mental <laughs> yeah. institution movie. Yeah, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Thank no, you. no, no. It's not. Oh, <laughs> damn it! Damn. Oh wait, so The Shining, Shelley Duvall, and then who else is in that? Oh, Time uh, Bandits. Yes. Oh. Hey. Hey. Yes. Murder on the Orient Express was Sean Connery. Mary ah. Shelley's Frankenstein was John Cleese. Uh, oh really? A- I don't remember a- that. Yeah. Alien was Ian Holm. Yeah. Straw Dogs was Peter Vaughn, and yes, I acknowledge that was a little mean of me. Uh, <laughs> Star Trek V was David Warner, the misdirect okay. being there because, of course, he was also in Star Trek VI in a different role. Yep. Uh, the Shining was Shelley Duvall, you were right on on that. The Bride was David Rappaport. Oh. And uh, Laurence Olivier's Richard III was Sir Ralph Richardson. Ah. <laughs> uh, good one. Good one. Right. <laughs> well, I... Uh... <laughs> Why don't do, we... Uh... Do, you, do you want one short one that might be a lot easier? Okay, okay, sure. we'll do one more. Yeah, d- d- this, is just, <laughs> this is just three, and the fact that it's just three is kind of a hint in its own right. Yeah. All right. Batman Forever. Which one was that? That was the... Okay. That was Val Kilmer. That was the one with Val Kilmer. Uh, yeah. Top Secret, also with also Val, with Val Kilmer. Kilmer. <laughs> and Police Academy 6, Mission to Moscow. Oh, I don't know which one that one is. Does <laughs> that one have one... Gutenberg? In, uh... It does not. No, it does not. Or uh, what's his face? Um, the guy who's a filmmaker now. Goldthwait. No. Bobcat no? Goldthwait? Uh, yeah. I, think he, I think he might have been in that. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> He's a good filmmaker, though. He is, a, he is yeah. a very interesting filmmaker, yes. <laughs> Wait, what were the first? I've already forgotten the yeah. first two. <laughs> Batman Forever. Do you want a hint there? It's not Val Kilmer. It, it's not Val Kilmer. Uh, well, no, the hint is played the same role in Batman, Batman Returns, and Batman. Yeah, Batman. okay. It's uh, <laughs> it's not a uh, like Michael Michael Goff or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, dra- 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 Dracula, uh, horror of Dracula, horror of Dracula. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Peter Cushing was in Top Secret. He was the Swedish bookseller. <laughs> and Christopher Lee was in Police Academy 6, Mission to Moscow. Oh, wow. Are you serious? <laughs> wow. That's hey, amazing. Re- like I say, remember the Lee Campbell Curry rule. <laughs> Which tell us? Uh, anything that gives uh, Christopher Lee, Peter, uh, or uh, 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 Tim Curry, or Bruce Campbell is uh, a paycheck is worth doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's... Sometimes, sometimes, if only on that grounds, <laughs> <laughs> that is appropriate. Yes. All right. Um, well, let's move on to our next segment where we ask e- ourselves a question. Uh, this week's question is: What are what are films that you find underrated? And then we're also going to do what films do you find overrated? Uh, but let's do underrated first. Um, I we already mentioned one that I was going to do, which was uh, Crawl. No, I yeah. love I've that never seen. movie. Oh, really? I, I, don't, I don't think I've seen it. Uh, I always get that one mixed up with Legend. I've seen Legend, 
Okay. Uh, no, they, crawl, are... crawl is radically different from that. Crawl yeah. is uh, one of the very few science fantasy films that I can point to outside of the Thor sub franchise inside the MCU. Yeah. Uh, and it it's 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 an amazing movie, and it has my second favorite. Used to be my favorite, but ultimately my second favorite film score ever. Uh, one of uh, one of James Horner's finest hours doing a better John Williams impression than John Williams himself <laughs> was doing at the time. Uh, with well, I, it, ju- just the was, most wonderful fanfare. <laughs> uh, the James Horner music reminded me of his work. He did work on uh, uh, Star Trek, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. No, it was right on the heels of uh, Star Trek's uh, 3 and 4. Actually, he may have actually scored it between the two of them. Uh, sorry, 2 and 3. Uh which themselves were a, a job that he got uh, from uh, having done some work uh, for Roger Corman, most notably in Battle Beyond the Stars. Okay. So he was he was you know well deep into uh, science fiction filmmaking at that point, but uh, onward and, and upward up until they reached Krull, which the producers thought was going to be the franchise to end all franchises, and oh God was it not! But <laughs> damn it, it should have been, and what a world it would be if it had been. <laughs> oh, I wish I would have loved to see sequels to that movie. Uh, the the widow of the web sequence is just one of my favorite stop motion sequences. I love that spider, even though they reuse one shot of it twice. Yeah, <laughs> you know you got to save money somewhere. Yeah, I mean it's a long movie and it has a lot of effects shots. Yeah, yeah. I always remember the uh, the fire horses uh, galloping off the cliff. Yeah. I love oh, that bit. My one of my favorite musical tracks of all time. Full stop. No qualifiers. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great score. Dun, 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 Yep. That's, that's, the fanfare is the one that sticks with me. Shane, we got, we got to get you seeing some crawl. Yeah. Throw it on the tile. Crawl up in your grill, yo. Well, do you have one for us? Talking to me? Yeah. Oh, I've got two, but there's one that I know for a fact that you absolutely hate. I don't yeah, know how Jennifer. I, I don't Those know how Jennifer feels about this, but this is a film. It's a fairly recent film. It's Jody Hill's Observe and Report. Starring, <laughs> Seth Rogen, Anna Faris, uh, Ray Liotta, which it's basically Paul Blart meets Taxi Driver. Yeah, and yeah. it goes like. Uh, yeah, no, that movie is, that movie is nerve annihilating. I actually consider that an extremely good uh, movie as well. It is a cruel film. It yes. is, yeah, it is so dark. Yeah, I it was it was too much for me. <laughs> I just Why'd remember... you stop, motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that scene. I don't think they could make that scene nowadays. Uh, I just remember showing it to a group of friends and just having people turn to me every five minutes, like, "What the fuck." <laughs> uh, and at the end of it, everyone just kind of quietly walked out of the room. Uh, which the, I, b- both fairly appropriate reactions to that film, but absolutely does not mean it's a bad movie. Quite the opposite in this case. Th- there is there is one other film that has given me the feeling that Observe and Report gave me, and that was Bad Lieutenant. The original or the yeah the, the Harvey the, Keitel. I actually haven't seen the Nicolas Cage one. Oh, the, uh, the, the, oh, the, the, so the, the, the Cage Herzog one is great. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah. That, that was my vote for best film of 2009, and 2009 was a good fucking year. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't have a lot to say in its defense, Observe and Report, other than just I thought it was, I enjoyed it. I, I liked the, the weird dark places it went. Yeah. Um, I, I find it an interesting movie, and uh, I thought the performances were great. And uh, yeah, I just really like it, and I, uh, I know it's a fantastic ensemble, some uh, some uh, really amazing uh, like you know joke lines. Like, why would I want to blow up the Chick Fil A? That shit is delicious. <laughs> yeah, again, some, uh, some early Aziz Ansari. Again, a line that has a very different cast all the way around. <laughs> if we uh, if we approach it uh, uh, through a more recent filter, but even then, hmm. uh, yeah, no, it's an excellent movie, and it is a deeply uncomfortable watch. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, uh, do you have one for us, Jenner? Um, well, I mean, of course, we've already covered Lady in the Water uh, on mm-hmm. on this show. Uh, probably my cause celeb in this case, and I know Nate will absolutely go round and round with me on this one, uh, is Alien 3. <laughs> no, that, that counts for this particular question. Yes. It, uh, it is definitely maligned by many. Yeah, no, it is, uh, it, I mean... 
I, I know you I know you hate it and I know exactly why. <laughs> and even you've acknowledged that you probably wouldn't hate it except for well, killing off Newton Hicks at the beginning of the film. So uh, I I do have something to say about that, but just about Alien Three itself. I've only seen it once. I kind of liked it. I was young. I saw it when it first came out. Uh, I don't remember much about it, but uh, I also know that it wasn't. It didn't Fincher want his name taken off of it? Uh, or... Fincher he, he flirted with it a bit. Uh, personally, I think that I am glad that his name remained on it, uh, just as Fincher's first directorial effort, and given the visual sensibility of the movie, I think it is aesthetically one of the most important movies of the 90s. Um, and, you know, just for you know, giving Fincher the, the druthers to go ahead and make stuff like Seven and The Game and Fight Club mm-hmm. and every, everything else that Fincher has done. Um, you know, just putting him on the map in the first place is important, but visually it's... Uh, the movie has an incredible visual sensibility, uh, possibly even more aesthetically daring. No, I can't really say that. Both uh, Alien and Aliens were visually sterling, and of course, obviously, you know, very deep in the visual stylings of uh, of their directors. But Alien Three maintained a similar sort of autens- uh, auteur sensibility. Uh, it's just in that case, by the time that they had decided that they wanted it not to be a sequel, but to be part of a franchise. Uh, he ended up running into a lot of uh, studio nightmarishness. Um, the documentary, uh, the three hour or two and a half hour, if you're watching it on the DVD, because even the documentary got butchered for its original <laughs> release uh, in the uh, the uh, Alien box sets, is pretty extraordinary in its own right. Um, it's a fascinating story. I still think that the final product is an amazing movie. Uh Granted, the theatrical version has flaws, and uh, actually, uh, hearkening back to Legend, which I know you mentioned earlier, the uh, extended or assembly cut has distinctly different flaws in some regards. I've seen some fan edit attempts to kind of hybridize the two of them, and I've got one that's actually a damn near perfect movie. Um, Has maybe one half of one scene too much. But aside from that, you know, kind of, uh, you can see, you can see what was there. You can see how it never kind of crept out, but it could have, damn it, it could have. And I still I'm, think, even even in its own right, it's still an amazing picture. I, I find Cameron's comments about him killing off Newt and Hicks funny, considering what did he do in the latest Terminator movie at the very beginning? <laughs> he killed off young John Connor. So I, I had a friend who had never seen the Terminator movies when Dark Fate came out. Dark Fate's the latest one, right? Yes, yes. And I wanted to see it, so I said, well, let's watch the other ones. So we watched Terminator 2, and then immediately watched Dark Fate, and as soon as John Connor dies, she's like, why did we just watch Terminator 2? What was the point of all that? He's just dead now. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, and Cameron had a hand in this. He, 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 his name yeah. was on the script. He endorsed the movie. And it's funny that he would do that after saying, oh, why would you kill off Newt? All, and, those, uh, years, all those years later, it's finally, fuck it, fuck it. Okay, fine, fuck it. Well, what, do you, <laughs> what else do you do with Eddie Furlong? Yeah, it was, I was, yeah. the alternative would have been getting him back for the picture. And then they'd have to pay for his drug habit and his court appearances. And... I, I actually have, a, a, on, a, on a slightly lighter note, uh, in the spirit of underrated movies, uh, I actually do have a recent recommendation that was absolutely underrated uh, when it was released, but uh, which uh, uh, the gang over here uh, caught uh, on Sunday and just had an absolute blast with. Mm-hmm. Moonfall. Roland really? Emmerich's latest really? wow. disaster is gloriously bonkers. <laughs> I mean, even the titles, like Moonfall, really? Like, it's, the moon's falling to Earth, right? Isn't that the general premise? Amongst other things. And apparently there's something <laughs> secret about the moon that we didn't know. Amongst that, other things. <laughs> that, those, those are the two things no, I know. No, 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 make, make no, it's the closest thing to a sheerly crackerjack movie that, uh, that Emmerich has done thus far. It's, uh, it, it's, it devours about two hours of material in the first 45 minutes, uh, and then just w- gets wackier from there. It's, uh, I don't know if it's great, but it's frickin' great. I don't know. The the last yeah. time I was fooled into checking out uh, anything by those guys was Independence Day two. Oh, I never saw that. I loved oh. the first one. Oh, Jesus. Independence Independence Day two would have been good if there had been an Independence Day three. 
I be. don't think that's true. <laughs> 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 it was it was in a, bad. In, a, in any event, though, moon, moonfall moonfall doesn't give you time to criticize it. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 that breathless, and it actually feels a lot more like Independence Day two than Independence Day two felt like Independence Day two. Okay. Uh, uh, so it, there are aliens in it or something? No comment. But okay. give give it a chance. Give it a okay. chance. It, it, right. it it's a riot. Actually, again, in the spirit of you know surprising uh, movies that uh, that uh, were surprisingly delightful by leaning into the bonkers i may or may not have mentioned it here before but venom 2 uh venom yeah, let there have. be carnage uh is an absolute blast for uh, very much the same reasons just you know ultimately it's just you know ah fuck it well very well then fuck it um, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, absolutely not so it again very underrated on its release but uh, a surprise uh, surprise joy that one was a hit it was, was successful. Yeah, it was well. successful, but it got terrible reviews. Yeah, I guess yeah. it fits under yeah. the underrated banner. Though I, I would wonder if something can be considered underrated if the public, uh, uh loves it at at that point. Because it, it depends on as, on whether you're asking a a critic or a member of the public. We're kind of in a post-critical world at this. <laughs> yeah, no. Point. That, a, co- a comment that Bob himself actually keeps making on a very regular basis as well. Basically, yeah. you know, professional cr- film criticism is dead, uh, he, he uh, often well, says. I mean, I have one that was hated by audiences and critics when it first came out, and I think it's come around now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think everybody here loves it, which is The Cable Guy. Yes, which, when yeah, it came that, out, that flopped, one came around. Um, because, you know, he was coming off of Ace Ventura, Dumb and Dumber. People were like, oh, Jim Carrey playing a cable guy is going to be wacky. That movie is dark as fuck. Yeah. It's disturbing. It's it's not what people expected. So it flopped. Everyone hated it. But I think now it's coming around to the, you know, cult classic or maybe even just a, a no, movie it's, that genuinely people love. No, I call it a legitimate cult classic at this point. Yeah. 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 I love that part where the spider crawls up his face. <laughs> That's because it's not digital. It's it's before they would do something like that digitally. And Jim Carrey was like, yeah, just let a spider crawl up my face. Do it. That's going to be great. <laughs> and it was. <laughs> Actually, um, another one I can kind of point to that got middling reviews and terrible cinema scores was Steven Soderbergh's Solaris, which we still need to cover on this program sometime. Well, I haven't seen the original yet. Yeah, exactly. I haven't seen the remake. And there uh, we go. Okay. <laughs> something something to look forward to. <laughs> I I don't want to get out of a uh, an underrated film conversation without mentioning Hudson Hawk. Yes. Jesus, I haven't seen yes. it. That's that's been on the that's been on the pile list for a while cuz I have the only person I know now well other than you two now was my dad. <laughs> my dad liked it. He saw that movie and liked oh, cool. it. My dad doesn't watch movies. Um <laughs> but I've never seen it myself. Well, somebody who doesn't watch movies might like that movie. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely underappreciated a sense of humor cinematically years ahead of its time uh, mm-hmm. to the point where that kind of you know para absurdism really came into vogue maybe 5 to 8 years later uh but uh, yeah no the movie was uh, was the yeah the movie was too good for the world it it dropped in um <laughs> and still some of the most amazing you know line reading edit combos i think that i have ever seen in any comedy movie. We know your favorite line from Richard I'll, E. Grant. Oh, yeah. I'll torture you so slowly, you'll think it's a career. <laughs> <laughs> Great line. Yeah. A little bit of fun facial expressions for the YouTube watchers there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of Hudson Hawk. I, though, uh, when I showed it to my, my now wife, uh, she was my girlfriend at the time, uh, we almost broke up because <laughs> we had such a big fight. She never finished the movie. Uh, she was she hated it so much, and she thinks that it's one just one of those movies that guys are gonna like more than girls. And she may be onto something. I'm not sure. I don't know about that. I don't really know many other people who like Hudson Hawk, so I think her assessment is fair, uh, considering the majority have that assessment. It's, it's um, you two and my dad. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that's it. And so I guess I, I forget, guess it's there I, are three I forget of whether us. Jane had an opinion on it or not. Realistically, she's probably seen it, probably liked it just fine, and doesn't remember it at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, knowing we, how these things go, but you know, if if you haven't seen it, Shane, that's one that uh, we probably ought to tackle at some point here. I yeah. know that very often you have a very different sensibility from uh, uh, from uh, us guys, so. 
Uh, I'd be interested in your take on it. Yeah, like, uh, I think you didn't like, uh, was it Dude Bro Party Massacre? Uh, I think we started watching part of it at your place. I think I just wasn't in the mood for it. Yeah. That's, I mean, what, I don't, I, that's what I still need to see. It's so funny. <laughs> I really liked it. But I, it's it's humor. Its sense of humor is somewhat similar to Hudson Hawk. Okay. Uh, it's really, uh, it's almost abstract. It's abstract. It's absurdist comedy. And it's just really, it's really funny. Okay. I mean, I, I definitely want to see it. I mean, well, I'm Hudson Hawk and Dude Bro Party Massacre. Yeah. <laughs> three. Sorry. Is, is, Party is, Massacre, is, three. is it actually the third one or is it just like a Leonard Part 6? Leonard uh, Part 6. Of... Okay. It's which I also, have it, I, which I'm, I also th- haven't seen. I'm thinking more Surf 2, but you know, similar principle. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen Leonard Part 6 and uh, I saw it when I was a kid and just did not get it at all. It, it's, it's a bad movie in my opinion. That's one I've still never actually seen. Any curiosity to examine it at this point would be a purely a morbid one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll just leave that there. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's necessary to watch at, at this point. It's probably not even available anymore. Yeah. I, I would guess. If I, it's going to be one guess. of those films that just dies. Mm. It, I mean, realistically, it, it died at first and you know, never really... I mean, it had a VHS release. You know there's a fan out there. You know there's one guy who's like, why isn't Leonard Part 6 on Blu-ray? Oh, I know that's a thing that happens as well, but uh, even that guy in the current climate should know to shut the hell up. Would, would you buy a copy just to have a complete collection? Maybe if I got it remaindered. <laughs> I'm still not sure. Maybe that one should just be left to the ether. And, uh, well, I mean, there's something to be said for historical curiosities. That said, that's a bit out there as they go. (laughs) I'm sorry I brought it up. (laughs) I I was just trying to think of a movie that had a number in it that didn't really correspond to a sequel. That movie's problems got problems. Yeah. No, I just like going off on tangents. (laughs) Oh, no, it happens. (laughs) (laughs) Well, does anybody else have uh, any other underrated films or, uh, I feel to... confident I could dig something out of the well, but you, you, I mean, it, it'll come back to us. This is probably one of those questions we need to re-examine later on, just you know, when got a little bit more warning about it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I had like five minutes to come up with a couple of movies. I'm sure there's others out there. Yeah, yeah, they're around, but we've we've managed to make a lot of conversation yeah. out of it. Well, I mean, I, I mean. You know that I have a tendency to run not so much toward underrated per se, or if they're underrated, it's just sort of completely incidental. My thing is obscure. Mm. Yeah, there are lots of movies I adore, ain't nobody ever freaking seen. But technically, I think that's a different one of the questions on the uh, on, yeah uh, on the list. So, yeah, 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 definitely. Now, if a I movie happens to be both obscure and underrated, you know that's that actually takes research. I'll, I'd have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> I mean, I guess by the definition of what underrated is, you could even say Un- Army of Darkness was underrated. Well, absolutely, it was on its original theatrical release, but again, that was more than most one of those things that was destined for instant cult classicdom, especially once variant editions of the thing started creeping out in overseas territories or on the damn sci-fi channel. Aside Captain from, Supermarket. Yeah, Captain Supermarket. And we get, of course, the 96-minute the ninety six minute director's cut of Army of Darkness is the longest of the Evil Dead movies, or at least the longest of the original Evil Dead movies. The 81-minute theatrical version of Army of Darkness is the shortest of the original Evil Dead movies. <laughs> Do you, do you prefer a version? Sci-fi channel version. Aside from the bleak ah. profanity, and I like the uh, uh, the slept too long uh, ending, uh, the uh, the uh, Rip Van Ash uh, ending <laughs> from uh, uh, the uh, from the director's cut. Aside from that, I think the definitive edition of that movie is the uh, the sci-fi channel cut, which thankfully was on the uh, I want to say three disc Blu-ray release from Shout Factory a few years back. All right. Yeah. I just finished the TV show. Uh, TV show was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The third season got a little wonky to me. I, I think uh, the, after they got rid of one of the showrunners and Rob Tappert just like took over completely, there were a few plot threads that I didn't really uh, see. It, it got resolved. a little flagging in spots. I did like the way they planted the ending, though. The yeah. End, the ending really worked for me. Though it made me angry there's not going to be another season because it ends on a cliffhanger. 
Oh, well, no, careful? it's not so much a cliffhanger as a now what happens. Uh, that's true. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Well, uh, why don't we go ahead and take our break there? Uh, right. We will be right back. Uh, next up, we're going to be talking about uh, Coda in one form or another. Um, we uh, we watch different Codas. Uh, we did this uh, on purpose. I well, I did it on purpose. They watched the Oscar nominee to I guess because it it follows up with our Oscar theme that we are continuing continuing to do three weeks after the Oscars. But that's okay. <laughs> we're going to keep doing it. Um, so you guys saw the Oscar nom uh, winner, yes. Coda. Uh, tell me about it. I don't, I don't know who made it, who was in it. I know Marley Matlin was in it. Yes. I don't uh, know anything beyond that. Well, it, it was written and directed by Dion Heater. Heder, stars Amelia Jones, who played Kinsey in the uh, Netflix show Lock and Key. Yeah. Uh, and oh. Okay. Also, the best supporting actor winning, best supporting actor winner, Troy Kotzer. And Marley Which Matt. I that one I actually do agree with. Um, he was fantastic. K K Kotzer was actually really fantastic. I mean, I, I like the movie, uh, but I will say it's maybe the best Lifetime movie I've ever seen. <laughs> That's the <laughs> that, way I would describe it. That I think was what they were pitching for uh, at first. My impression for most of the movie after it started was that uh, this is a technically adequately executed. Uh, it's a feel-good movie for most of its running time. Uh, it's, you know, it seemed like it was, you know, a, a, a occasionally uh, endearing, uh, occasionally funny. Uh, I mean, ooh, gross-out humor with deaf people. That's different. Uh, really? I, I can see, uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's got, it actually does have some very funny scenes about just how gross uh, the, uh, the hearing girl's deaf parents can be. <sighs> Yeah, um, Kotzer, Troy Kotzer is hilarious in it, and his, Troy his interactions is, with his daughter are yeah. are hilarious. Yeah, his his performance is is genuinely fantastic, and that one I can actually agree with. I find the film ultimately they lost me toward the end. Uh, ultimately, I found it sort of deeply problematic. I think the point that planted it for me is the lead actress has to give a uh, audition to the Berklee College of Music uh, at the end of the movie. She's not supposed to have anybody in the uh, in, in the uh, the room with her. Uh, uh, you know, like uh, her parents and uh, and uh, brother who are all deaf are supposed to stay outside. Uh, and uh, she ends up uh, giving a performance of Both Sides Now by um, uh, Joni Mitchell. Joni Mitchell. And the thing was, her performances, her musical performance, her pipes are good. Her performances all through the movie up to this point have been good. She does not land that song. But a, a little ways into, I mean, her highs are fine, her lows, thud. Um, but the thing is, halfway through, she sees that her parents have snuck into the balcony up top, and the people who are conducting the interview see that uh, her parents have snuck up into the top, and she starts signing the song at them. But the actual vocal performance is unimpressive, and ultimately she ends up getting into the school, which lends itself, I think, as much as anything else, to the accidental implication that admitting her to the school was basically a form of virtue signaling, which is not a phrase that I toss around anything other than gingerly. And at the same time, the movie itself is so mild, uh, so yeah, there's, okay. I mean, there's, you know, there are... U ultimately, it feels like the Oscar was virtue signaling as well. And of course, the Oscars, well, I mean, they do that anyway. But leaving that aside, ultimately, the more I think about it, the more I really didn't like it. Because basically, it's the story about somebody who's su uh, supremely talented in one particular regard going after her dream and uh, surpassing uh, op or es uh, escaping obstacles to her following that dream, which is her disabled family. Um, 
I don't know what the message was supposed to be here, but what I got is not good. And it, at this point, I actually do kind of really wish that uh, that uh, uh, Jane hadn't uh, uh, gone a visiting for this episode because I, I think her she kept referring to it as ableist porn, <laughs> which I pretty much have to agree with. But as the mother of a special needs uh, son, I think she's a lot more qualified to speak on that subject as well. And also, the other thing I was thinking about through through the movie is basically, it, it's essentially most of the time treating the heroine's particular gift as an in, an inherent form of merit. Um, this, is, this is a little bit odd, but I think this movie would have been more interesting if she wasn't actually a particularly good singer. Uh, it would have been a very different movie, but I think it might have had something more interesting to say if that had been the case, but at, at the same time, I mean, the acting was generally good. I mean, Marley Matlin's uh, character as uh, as the girl's mother is absolutely obnoxious for the first three quarters of the movie, then does an unbelievably abrupt face turn. Granted, if the face turn hadn't been unbelievably abrupt, the movie would probably be about ten minutes longer. But it still feels like there's a lots of lots of stuff that lots of expository material that should have been in this movie that wasn't. Um, like, uh, okay, so she, the, the entire family has been used to leaning on the girl as a crutch to be her interpreter, or, or to be their interpreter. And they keep saying that they need to get a hearing person to interpret for them. But they never actually do, even by the end of the movie, where she's gone off to college, and, you know, they're, you know, just hanging back, uh, you know, manning the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the family business, which is coming up, without anybody to actually honking interpret for them. I um, thought no. I thought there was a scene they they show them training an interpreter on the boat, or was that the brother? I thought after she left, there was a scene of someone new on the boat with them. That I might have missed. I think I might have been ranting about how bad her performance of both sides now was at that point. So if I missed that, uh, you know, forgive me on that front. Um, well, we definitely know what Jenner thought of this movie. <laughs> um, I, I would have liked it until I didn't, and it, and the more I think about it, the less I do. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Shane? Well, well, I, so I mean, I I enjoyed it. I I do. I do acknowledge its faults. I I also agree with that that final song. It didn't seem even if she nailed it, it didn't seem like a great showcase for for her vocals. And I think it was used because, I, I believe there was a montage of of other things happening over that song, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, her, 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 and and also like I say, it it also sort of cheats by, uh, initially she's just being accompanied by uh, her. Uh, choir teacher on the piano but as we're listening to the thing it goes on they introduce you know a guitar in the background and by the time that the, the that it goes into the whole montage it's a full symphony orchestra she cheated she fucking cheated uh to get into the berkeley college of music and i feel like a lot of the conflicts in the movie were sort of easily solvable so i don't know so i admittedly don't have any deaf friends i don't know much about the deaf community this is a movie set in modern day, and at only one point during the movie does anyone use a phone to try to communicate, like use texting to communicate. Or at one point, there's one scene where someone uses a pen and paper to communicate, which is just to write deaf, to show that they're deaf. I don't know if it's a point of pride with certain deaf communities where they only want to sign and don't want to use text-to-speech, don't want to write. They never do those things in the, in the movie. They, 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 they keep on saying, we can't communicate with people because we can only sign. Yeah, they don't, they don't read lips. Um, which... Essentially, they are non-assimilatory deaf, uh, deaf people, which is tricky. And yeah, seems seems odd, but something um, that the movie could definitely have stood to expound upon a bit more, I think. Yeah, and um, what was I going to say? Um, there there was some, there was a big deal with you know you know they're they're a fishing family, um, and fishing is not going well. They're being ripped off by the by the middleman. So at one point, they decide. We're going to sell our own fish off the boat. And they keep on talking about, oh, this is a big risk. How, how is this going to work? And then after they decide to do it, there's it no... It just happens. It just happens. It's just something they're doing now. There's no examination of how, how they're now interacting with the, the union or whatever that has control of the market or the other people who've joined their co-op, how, how their communication with them is going. It's just all of a sudden, now they're part of the community, finally. Now people like them. Um, so that's never really examined. Um, 
the uh, the music. She has a music teacher who's fantastic, by the way. I don't know who played yeah. him. Uh, Eugenio Derbez. Really great performance. Yeah, he, he was he, actually he, really terrific. He starts out really cartoony, then then you of course he becomes like the mentor. And at one point she's like late to one of her practices, and he's like, "If you're late again, fuck you." She's late for the next one because the news crew shows up to interview her family about their fishing co-op, and they need her to communicate with the interviewers. And her mom didn't warn her. <laughs> that and she just she tells the teacher, "Sorry, I can't make it." Instead of telling his the teacher, "Hey, my family's livelihood depends on what I'm about to do. I'm going to be late because our business depends on it." She just says, "Oh, I can't make it." And he's like, "Well, fuck you. I'm not going to teach you anymore." That's but like then a, he conti- but then he continues to kind of mentor her anyway, or at least it's implied, I guess. Yeah, he basically realizes she really wants it, and uh, was like, "All right, fine, I'll take you back." I mean, these are these are problems with the movie, but overall, I thought it was it was very heartfelt. The, the performances are funny. Or the performances are very good. The interactions are really funny with with the parents and the daughter and, and the brother. The message is really muddled. The message though. is weird. I wasn't sure what the me- the message was. There was actually, I think it was last year. There was a better film, uh, featuring deaf characters. That it's, it's called Sound of Metal, about a young musician who's going deaf, and and he sort of joins this like commune of of deaf people. Um, that's a really fantastic movie. That one I wanted to give a look. That was it's, what it's, was it? Riz, really Riz Ahmed. Riz Ahmed, yeah, yeah. And I believe the. There was also a deaf actor in that who was nominated, but he didn't win. Uh, but that's a really excellent movie. There were... Uh, I'm just looking over my notes right now. Um, there's during the, there's a scene near the end. So her parents are resistant to her wanting to go out and, and pursue her music thing. They're like, we need you. They come around during this recital. They finally attend her recital, which of course she can't. they can't hear. And they, they do cut to a, a POV of them where they just hear silence. They just see her on stage. And I was really confused as to what this scene was supposed to convey. It's supposed to be the scene where they finally get it, right? Yeah. The scene starts with them watching. And then they start the, the mother and father start talking about going grocery shopping or something like that. And the girl sees it on stage that they're signing to each other. And, of course, she can understand it because she can, she can see it. Um, Didn't but, these people ever learn to freaking read lips? They, they they actually mentioned they don't the brother sort of read lips that's it yeah um they yeah they they I I don't know how how real deaf communities real deaf families deal with this it just seems like they're purposely either they can't expect everybody to understand sign language that's just absurd yeah. you know as much as we should be more open and we should be accommodating to people with different levels of abilities yeah. To not even meet us halfway with just writing things on a piece of paper, or in, in, in only insisting on signing to people is is an odd choice, and uh, I'm not sure what they were trying to get at with presenting the family in that way. Also, you'd figure that if you're watching a musical performance, the visual aspect of the performance is kind of a significant aspect of that experience. Uh, Reading up uh, on this a little bit uh, on Wikipedia, especially in the slightly loaded uh, subcategory, response from deaf community. Uh, oh, that would be interesting to see here. Yeah, one, uh, uh, one critic uh, uh, named uh, Jenna Beacombe, uh, Beacom, I believe, uh, appreciated the representation, but uh, noted as a pa- deaf parent of a singer herself, Beacom found the film's assumption that being deaf means that you can't enjoy music or understand anyone else's enjoyment to be unfounded. And that's that, that's the thing is it, it's not so much the not getting music oneself; it's not having empathy for anyone who does that just kind of doesn't make sense. It, 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 it didn't make sense to me. Basically, uh, her 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 dad was a bit of uh, the, our 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 protagonist's uh, dad was a bit of a mess. Her mom was a monster until she just kind of decided not to be. <laughs> this is uh, ah yeah yeah. <laughs> what what, uh, what is the meaning behind the title? Because there is meaning behind the title for the other two. Uh, children of of deaf uh, adults also. The end of a musical piece. It's a yeah, pun, you see. Meaning. They never, mm. they never explain the acronym in the movie. I, I, I assume they would. I, I read up on it to, to, to discover it myself. But yeah, they don't, they don't mention it in the movie. Isn't yeah. that cute? 
It's 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 cute. It's so fucking cute. It's so fucking cute. Could you die? Could you just I could. die? I could die. Yeah. But I liked it. Yeah, no, I so. am not. I, 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 even if you liked it, you have to agree. This was not best picture material. No. Granted, no, it the, was not. granted the the Oscars. I mean, they're. I mean, fuck the Oscars. But at the same time, it's the fucking Oscars. You know, have some standards. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, quick pause. I need to run upstairs and get my notes. Uh, just hold still. I'll edit this part out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hopefully he can fill 15 minutes with uh, the other CODAs, because I'm out. That, there just isn't that much to talk about. Well, no, I mean, my impression was, uh, my impression was that the, uh, the, uh, the Patrick Stewart one was a freaking experience. I have no idea how, but uh, I wish I had gotten to it. I just didn't get the chance to. Yeah, I, I did enjoy that we learned almost right off the bat the signs for shit face twat waffle, or, or at least their improvised you know brother sister sign. Oh, yeah. I did forget to mention you know the girl, the lead actress, she she learned sign language for this movie. She spent nine months doing it. Well, that's and pretty cool. As far as I could tell, she's as far as I could tell from a you know with no knowledge, she seems fluent in it. It looked fairly credible. I, I am told that uh, one of the major criticisms about the uh, the, the French film that uh, that Coda was a remake of was that the uh, a lot of the French sign language used in the movie apparently was just absolute horseshit. Hmm. They they needed sub they needed uh, subtitles for the uh, uh, for uh, uh, for deaf viewers for uh, for that. And of course, the, the, your first mistake always is remaking a French comedy. <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> you might not actually have to edit this part, Nate. We actually have had a, a couple of interesting points while you're we're gone here. I okay, think. all right. Uh, all right I'll, we'll, I'll, see, we'll we'll see how you tell you take a look at it. You tell us what you think. I'll cut around some of the bits and pieces that uh, pull back the curtain. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, interesting. Uh, I will uh, maybe see that movie one day. I'm not sure at this point. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's very good. It's like I say it. It was pleasant enough to watch until it really pissed me off. And after that happened, it, I pretty much stayed pissed off. <laughs> well, why don't, why don't you guys let me tell you the story yeah. of Patrick Stewart's Coda? <laughs> Do tell. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, think, I think I mentioned I watched the trailer and read the synopsis, but you, yeah. you, it's all you. Okay. Okay. So it opens with uh, Patrick Stewart as a pianist. He's a concert pianist. Uh, he does recitals and that kind of thing. And he's very famous. Everybody knows who he is. And on one of his big comeback shows, um, cause he's apparently been out away from it for so long. Uh, his comeback shows, he doesn't do an encore, which everybody is like, why didn't you do an encore? And it's because he was freaking the fuck out. He has like crazy anxiety, stage fright. He can't, he can't bring himself to go out there and do do this again. Mm. So he meets Katie Holmes. Katie Holmes is like, oh, you're the best in the entire world. You're such a good pianist, and and I can help you and do an interview with me. And he's like, no, I fucking hate interviews, and slams the door in her face. And uh, then uh, Giancarlo Esposito comes around, and uh, he's he's like, okay, I'm an agent, and I'll just be saying agent things. Uh, like it, it, Most of his lines are, you'll be fine, man. And that's it. They they got Giancarlo Esposito to play a character whose lines are mostly "You'll be fine, man." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, so that that feels like a waste of material. <laughs> and uh, my impression, real quick, is that Katie Holmes was like a manic, manic pixie dream girl, but hopefully, hopefully not with the romance. I really hope that's not where this is going to go. Oh, oh shit! Okay. All right. <laughs> just, oh, this is one of those movies. Just you <laughs> wait. Just you wait. <laughs> so there are bizarre special effects. Uh, Picard has to use a body double for the piano playing. Uh, uh, so they CG his head onto the piano player's body, and it looks really awkward and weird. And other than that, they're just doing intercuts of, uh, of hands playing, and, and that's fine and all. Um, I did figure out why Patrick Stewart took this movie. He's like 110 years old, and he gets to sit throughout this entire film. Every single scene is characters sitting in a chair or on a couch or in a car or on a piano bench. They never, there's no walking and talking. There, there are a few cuts of, of, of uh, Patrick Stewart 
going around uh, Switzerland, like uh, climbing the Swiss Alps, basically. But it's like not the Swiss Alps. It's just like a little hill that he keeps climbing and <laughs> and he keeps getting out of breath. And at one point he has to sit down and I swear it looks like his legs give out from under him. And I'm like, this is why he only wants to do sitting movies. Why he, is he in the Swiss Alps? He's a piano player. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. You so, figure if you're climbing a mountain, that's not going to be good for your hands. Captain <laughs> Picard is climbing a mountain. Climbing a mountain. Ah, <laughs> uh, I think my Sorry. favorite my favorite part was, uh, one of my favorite parts was a dream sequence where Patrick Stewart is in a rowboat and he rows to a dock and there's a door on the dock uh, that leads into a concert hall. But the way they have to edit the scene is they cut to a shot, a close-up of him on the rowboat then they cut to a shot of the dock and he's coming toward it. And then they do this like weird digital cloud that goes over and across him. And then suddenly he's on the dock. So he didn't have to climb out or anything. He's, he just did a, a weird ass special effect to make him get onto the dock because he's old as shit and he shouldn't be making movies anymore. Uh, there's a uh, really obvious audio off sync editing. It's really bad. <laughs> e. <laughs> uh, oh, they have uh, Patrick Stewart smoke because he's trying to calm his nerves from his uh, from his condition. And Patrick Stewart just looks like he's going to vomit the entire time. I'm not sure the man has ever smoked, but it looks terrible. He, he's I don't think he's held a cigarette before. I've, uh, he does not look like he has, at least. Um, so anyway, Katie Holmes starts smiling a lot and she shows up in, in his life a whole bunch. Like he's got another recital and, and she's like boosting his confidence and saying, but you're so good and you're so great. And then one day after they're, they're all chumming it about, he, he says, so this one time I was married and it was great. And then my wife died. And now I'm sad. And then that's why I didn't play piano for two years and have my comeback recital. And Katie Holmes is like, oh, my God. OK, so she died. That's terrible. Maybe I can be the replacement. And uh, so <laughs> so she's being all sultry. And she is sultry throughout this thing toward him. She's very smiley. And that like, seems deeply inappropriate. <laughs> oh, oh, it's great. It's great. <laughs> um, we. Uh, Let's see. What else do I have written down here? Everything's surface level, overwritten, uh, As, uh, o overproduced from the sounds of it. As well. This is one of those movies with lots of meaningless dream sequences, right? Uh, yeah, it's got a couple of meaningless dream sequences. It's a lifetime film. This is yeah. this is actually a lifetime film, just a step yeah. above production wise, but three it's steps below a, writing wise. So it's like a lifetime movie if it had been made by a guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we what get to white nonsense is this. <laughs> now this is just the first half hour of the movie is all this oh, stuff. Geez. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've still got a ways to go. Um though I'm gonna skip over a lot of it and you'll understand why in a moment. Um so he and Katie Holmes start start like really liking each other. They're best friends Giancarlo Esposito calls her in when he's having problems to help him get through the problems and and then he reveals something huge which is uh Picard's wife actually killed herself like he tells this nice story of like well there was this one day where we were making plans together and the next day she was gone and it turns out it's because she killed herself with his sleeping pills so Katie Holmes is like, oh, that sucks. I'm not going to use that in my article because I'm a good person. And uh, so, so he's about to leave for another concert. He has to fly out somewhere. And she comes up to him and, and he says to her, you know, I'm very old. And she says, what, don't you like younger women? And then they fucking French kiss. Like Ew. tongue. Which is the most disturbing thing I have ever seen in a movie. Uh, okay, so in, in terms of the clamminess factor for on-screen kisses, with one minimal clamminess being Kevin Costner and Susan Sarandon in Bull Durham, and ten being Henry Danielle and Edith Atwater in The Body Snatcher 1945. <laughs> What do you think? 
way off the charts. It's, Ooh. it's, I mean, there's a squick factor there that is, that you cannot pass up. I, I mean, it's beyond, he's not into it. You can tell she's not, she's acting her best. She's doing what she can with, with what she's got. And by God, she's going to make it happen. So directly the next scene, directly after this one, Katie Holmes is driving down the highway in a convertible, and then she runs into a fucking car. Dead. Just dead. What? In the next scene. Like, they cut hard cut to her in a convertible. The sun's out, so it's blinding her eyes. She weaves into tra- oncoming traffic and dies. You this know, was, This was not it, in the Wikipedia summary. Okay, if the Patrick Stewart character is some kind of roundabout mysticistic like life vampire thing that actually would make sense for this if it turned out that it was actually a horror narrative the whole time and the next scene he was looking noticeably younger and with a bit more of a spring in his step they're going to attribute him it to him just getting some but it turns out no he ate her fucking life yeah that would be that actually would might make for a fairly interesting movie is this like in fabric where now it's going to cut to a totally different set of characters like that that, that story's just over now Like, I didn't know, she, I wasn't expecting her to die. I'm pretty sure I didn't read that in the Wikipedia summary. It's so weird. Wait, how far, into the, how far into the movie is this? Like, halfway? Two-thirds? 60 or? minutes. What 60 year minutes. was this movie? So this is like, this is 2020. Wait, so it's this is 2020. Lo- there's still yeah, a lot of movie to go after she dies? Yes. And the next half hour, and I am not exaggerating here, I swear to God, the next half hour is, is Captain Jean-Luc Picard just wandering around the countryside. And then he goes back to his hotel plays chess with the guy who works there and then goes and walks the countryside in dead silence. That is 30 minutes of film, 30 minutes. Then he gets after all of that and having to sit through it and not fall asleep. He gets the article that, uh, that Katie Holmes wrote for him. And it's just a love letter to him and how great he is and wonderful and and how he's so perfect and the best pianist in the world. So he gets the confidence again to get over her death and go play piano one more time, and then it cuts to black. So it's like a Woody Allen movie without the jokes. Ooh, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah one of the one 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 of those you know. You know, young female muse inspiring old as dirt, old creative bastard. Yeah. No, j- no I j- thought we oh, were Oh, I'm over- sorry. I'm sorry. I-, I thought we were over those by now. There was one joke in the entire film. Fate despises a convertible. Okay, that's actually not bad. Yeah. <laughs> pa- Patrick Stewart says it after he finds out she's dead. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, read the fucking room. Jesus Christ. Yeah, no, that... Like- who wrote and directed this? Just... Uh, shit, I had it written down. Uh, this was Claude, Claude Lalonde. Lalonde was the director, and it was oh, written that's by right. uh, Louis Godbout. Yeah, I, so I'm on Wikipedia. So not, he... so not only they were, were they dudes, but they were French. Yeah, yes. and neither of them have yes. Wikipedia pages for themselves. Their, their names are in black instead of blue. They're, and I'm looking yeah. over the plot summary again, there's no mention of her death. It mentions that she, she urges him to go to this place in the Alps, and then he recovers there. Yeah, he recovers from her death. <laughs> it's so okay. This sounds th- like I say. This sounds like a joke about French cinema. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it. It feels oh, uh, like a joke about French cinema. Having her die off the way she does. Was it? Was it Saturday Night Live uh, or one of the other uh, like sketch shows? Like. Ten years ago, doing that bit about uh, you know a, a a creative in his fifties falling for a sixteen year old girl in <laughs> in, in an art house type movie type thing, yeah. and just you know kind of leaning absolutely into the squick. That squick was always freaking there, man. <laughs> I, like I say, I thought we were over this white nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> this movie came out in twenty twenty. Yeah. 2020 is going to 2020, yo. This had to have more than a million dollars. This had to be like a $10 million budget film, at least, at a minimum. I'm, I'm shocked. I mean, well, there's, a, there's a car crash to shooting in the Swiss Alps? No, there's not a car crash. 
there is the there is a shot from the perspective of the car where the sun is glaring through ninety percent of the shot, and then you see the shadow of a car coming alongside her as, as the camera kind of moves oh, into so, the other lane. So they pulled a Meg Ryan on the bike in City of Angels, and they and they oh, go yeah. to white. <laughs> yeah, they dissolve to white. Yeah. Okay. Although in that case, what was she, wasn't she like? Didn't she like not look at the road? Wasn't she like looking at yeah, the she sky? Yeah, she was. She was like looking at the sky on a bicycle, and you know, then then a truck very languidly came up in the lane that she was in. But yeah, no, it's it, it's a, and then of course everything just goes to white because I thought you know, that movie was hilarious because it's arty. Oh, I love the scene yeah. where Nicholas Cage <laughs> discovers hot water in the shower for the first time. <laughs> he like walks in, gets burned. He's like, ah, oh! he's like butt naked, walks in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since I've seen that movie. It's been quite a while. Uh, so I what... actually kind of liked it, mostly for Nicolas Cage. But, uh... <laughs> I was very into Vim Vendors at the time, so I hated it. Okay. Yeah. Um, overall, I would say watch Coda. It is <laughs> fucking hilarious. <laughs> if you can make it through the half an hour walking around the woodlands. Every shot is locked down. Every single one. They have like, oh no, That's... I'm sorry. There's one shot. There is a snap zoom that they do. And they do it as a digital effect where they have a digital Jean-Luc Picard in the middle of a city and they snap zoom from way up high uh, at the, at the showing the entire city. It just snap zooms in on him. You're going to do one camera movement and it's a fucking snap zoom? Yeah. That's a choice. This movie is magical. I did not know that something like this existed, and I'm so glad I watched it. <laughs> got me curious now. I mean, <laughs> some things you gotta witness. Yeah. I mean, I mean, props, props to Patrick Stewart, I suppose, for following that sort of, you know, classical British working actor tradition. You know, as uh, I guess it was Michael Caine who put it. It's you know, rather like, uh, rather like uh, calling a plumber. Basically, uh, the phone rings, a job is offered, a price is negotiated, the job is performed, the price is paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, well, we should probably call it there. Uh, I think that's going to be it for us uh, here on What's on the Pile. How, how was the animated movie? Oh, I'm shortly. sorry. We didn't have time to talk about it. Uh, it was very good. It was okay. very interesting. It was about a, a guy who wanders out of a club drunk. And he falls into the street and gets run over by a taxi. And uh, then his spirit leaves his body and death follows him. And he runs from death and, and says, uh, I just want a little more time. And she's like, as you wish. And so she she rebirths him. And he's a he's a baby. And he keeps asking for things like, I want to see, I want to feel the ocean between my feet. I want to see the sky. Uh, I want to be a part of the sky, things like that. And she takes him on this adventure uh as a baby and she allows him to grow into a man and then into an old man and then she envelops him into herself and uh he is and that's the end of the movie that sounds that neat sounds, yeah sounds lovely it's really good it's right. i think it's probably the best of all these codas thank you for reminding me uh <laughs> that i wanted to talk about it because i did watch it no, that that actually sounds quite lovely it's uh, on if, uh if it's on correctly. youtube so everybody can watch it on youtube We'll give it a look. Okay. Yeah. See, we, we we snatched the silver lining out of this uh, you know, by hook <laughs> or by crook. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that is going to do it for us here on What's on the Pile. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at What's on the Pile. Uh, you can find us on YouTube under Punch Bunny's YouTube channel. Or you can visit our website, whatsonthepile.com. Thanks for hanging out.